Welcome to Walking by Faith. We're passionate about sharing God's Word and helping you grow in your faith. To get pastor's notes, download the Walking by Faith app today. Today, we are again talking about the Scarlet Line. Pastor will be explaining how in the Old Testament, we see that they sacrifice a lamb once a year, but Jesus paid that ultimate sacrifice once and for all. Jesus is our sacrificial lamb and the power of his blood washes our sins away every day. Let's take a look at today's message, the cross and the blood. Today, we're gonna to continue talking about the blood of Jesus. Uh, I would probably entitle this one, The Blood of His Cross. But we're going to just give a quick review um, about a few things that we've covered about the blood. You, you cannot believe for what you do not know. And it's Andrew Murray who said this. He said, the, 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 the greatest benefits of the cross and the blood, specifically, many people do not receive because of ignorance. They don't know. So faith is dependent on knowledge. So you can't believe for what you do not know. Now, Romans 3, verse 25, I believe we've got it right here on the screen. It says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. So the way Jesus becomes a propitiation for you is through faith in his blood. And of course, that word is not one you use every week. They don't have any propitiation at Myers or Costco. The word, other translations say sacrifice. So he becomes a sacrifice for you through faith in his blood. Or other translations will say a mercy seat through faith in his blood. So you and I need to believe in the blood. And we need to know what the blood has purchased for us. The Bible says it redeemed us. Because of this blood, there's forgiveness. There's cleansing. There's sanctification. Uh, uh, literally, the, the, there's this huge list of things that only are received by us through faith in his blood. 1 Peter 1.18 says, Knowing that you weren't redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from the aimless conduct or the lifestyle received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. So the way that God redeemed you, bought you back, when Adam sinned, humanity fell with him. And unfortunately, Adam did not reproduce in the condition God created him. He reproduced in the condition that he fell to. And so his children were also subject to the dominion of sin, death, and the devil. So God wanted to buy us back from that condition. And the Bible says that he did it with the precious blood of Jesus. Now, the Bible refers to Jesus' blood as precious blood. Now, the reason is because it wasn't, it's, it's, it's special blood. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, it says, take heed to yourselves. And all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So Jesus' blood was God's blood. And God didn't purchase you with a human corruptible blood, but he purchased you with an incorruptible, precious blood. He purchased you, the Bible says, with his own blood blood. That's why Jesus' blood could do what no other blood could. Now, in Leviticus 17, verse 11, it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for your soul. Now, all through the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, when someone would sin, they would bring an animal and they would go to the temple. And they would confess their sin and lay their hand on that animal and transfer their guilt to the animal. And then the priest would examine the animal. And if the animal was without blemish, then you were accepted and you were forgiven. 
It wasn't based on your performance. It was based on the performance or the purity of your substitute. Now, those animals were all types of Jesus. In fact, literally, the, the, in the Old Testament, the priest only once a year could go into the Holy of Holies where God's presence was above the mercy seat. And the Bible says he could never go in without blood. And he would sprinkle that blood seven times. He did that on the Day of Atonement every year, year after year after year after year after year. Because the blood of a goat or a calf or a lamb, it couldn't take away sin. But it was a picture of what was going to happen someday when the Lamb of God would come and take away the sin of the world. And the Bible says that Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So it's the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. And the power of the blood is in the worth of the life. The power of the blood is in the worth of the life. That's why the life of a calf or a lamb couldn't take away sin. Jesus' blood was the power of divine life dwelling and working. And it released almighty and unceasing power. Now, there's an old song that says that the blood has not lost its power. It is an unceasing power. Now, in Hebrews 13 and 20, it says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So Jesus was raised from the dead through the blood of the everlasting covenant or because of the blood. Exactly what happened, we, 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 the Bible tells us some of the things that happened from the cross to the throne. Things happened. Jesus was on that cross. He died. He shed his blood. But there are some things that the Bible tells us that happened in between when he died on that cross and when he was seated at the right hand of God. And exactly how, we do not know. But Jesus' blood was collected. It says this in Acts 2.31. For seeing this, David, he was a king, but he was also a prophet, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul would not be left in Hades. Now, one of the things that we know happened when Jesus died is his soul went to Hades. Now, how many of you remember the Apostles' Creed? He descended into hell. He descended into hell. Exactly what happened, some of the details we know. The Bible tells us in the book of Peter that he spoke to the spirits that were disobedient in the days of Noah. And he told them the promised Messiah who you did not believe would come has come. We know from Genesis chapter 3 in verse 15 that he crushed Satan's head. At some point, he went over, he found the devil, he knocked him down, he picked up his foot, he put it on his head, he reached down and he grabbed some keys. Because he arose from the dead and said, I am he who was dead, but I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. He took them. He took them. We know some of the things that he did. But none of Jesus' body or blood saw corruption. It was collected. And at some point, Jesus took it into heaven. Hebrews 9, verse 11 says, but Christ came as a high priest of good things to come with the greater, more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation. So Moses made a tabernacle. Later on, Solomon made one. Zerubbabel made one. Ultimately, Herod made one. And every year, the high priest would go into the holy place, put the blood on the mercy seat. But Jesus went into a tabernacle not made with human hands. He went into the tabernacle that God has in heaven. And not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place in the tabernacle of heaven once for all. The priest had to go in every year because the blood of a goat or a calf, it could never take away sin. 
But Jesus' blood could pay for sin once for all because it was God's blood. And the value of the blood is in the value of the life. And it says, having obtained eternal redemption. Other translations say, an everlasting release. So what Jesus did one time with his blood is he paid for sin. Now, the Bible tells us that the resurrection of Jesus was through the blood. But not just his resurrection was through the blood. Your resurrection was through the blood. Now, in, in uh, Roman and Greek thought, the body was very unimportant. In fact, the body was kind of like evil. And it was kind of like a good thing to get rid of it. Right? Get rid of your body. In fact, in the year 300, in the Roman Empire, when someone died, 99% of people were cremated and 1% were buried. 1%. 313, Constantine becomes a Christian. A few years later, Christianity becomes the religion of the Roman Empire. And by the year 400, listen, 99% of people, when they die, are buried. And 1% are cremated. And you say, Why? Because in Christianity, your body's important. You were redeemed spirit, soul, and body. When Jesus arose, he didn't arise as a spirit. He said, come and touch me. Put your hand in the holes. Put your fist in the hole in my side. And then he said, give me something to eat. And they gave him a honeycomb. And they gave him a fish. And he ate them. He arose in a physical body. So in Christianity, the body was considered to be important. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15 says when we die as Christians, we sow the body looking to the resurrection. Uh, when, when Moses died, God took care of the funeral, right? And the Bible says God buried him. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. And it's not supposed to both to be just the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's supposed to be about your death, your burial, and then your resurrection. Because the Bible says as surely as God raised Jesus, he's going to raise you. Now, somebody said, well, what if, they, what if they're burned? What if, what if they're cremated? What if they're eaten by a shark? How many know that's not a problem for God? Amen. I mean, the God who said, let there be light, and the universe jumped into existence... I don't know if he kept one of your cells or what he did. He can clone you or what he's going to do, but he's going to take care of it. He's going to take care of it. And when Jesus comes back, you're going to be raised. Now, to, today, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We all know that. So the body dies, is buried, but the spirit and the soul go to be with the Lord. First Thessalonians Chapter 4, verse 13. But I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep or who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Uh, I, I have literally seen people climb into caskets and try to shake people, bring them back, because they have no hope. There's sorrow. You know, when somebody dies and you're a Christian, there's sorrow. Because we aren't going to see them for a while. But we're going to see them again. And we know where they are. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, how many are believing? Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep or who have died in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have fallen asleep or have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Those that are Christians that have died in the Lord are the first to rise. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall forever be with the Lord, therefore comfort one another with these words. So when Jesus comes back, those that are believers that have died, they rise first. 
Those that are alive and remain are caught up together to meet him in the air. They call that the rapture. Somebody says, I don't believe in that. Well, then you stay. We're going. <laughs> we're on the first. I don't know about you, but I'm on the first train out. Right? Now, somebody says, well, if their body's in the grave, what is it? The, how are they in heaven? Are they kind of like Casper? And they're just kind of floating around like a sheet or something. Not at all. Not at all. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Check me out. This is what it says. I knew a man in Christ 14 years ago. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. How such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Saw things that it's not lawful to speak. Whether in the body or I out of the body, I don't know. God knows. Now, I want to ask you this question. If you went to Costco and left your body home, would you miss it? <laughs> you go, yes. And I say, no. Because Paul went to heaven and didn't know if he took his body or not. Is it not true? It's true. Right? Now, in Luke 16, Jesus talks about two men that have died. Right? The one, he lifts up his eyes. Now, the Bible says they've been buried. He lifts up his eyes. And he says, hey, send that other guy with just some water on his finger and put it in my tongue. So listen, 1 Corinthians 15, there is a physical body and there is a spiritual body. So your spirit has a body. Is God a spirit? Does God have a body? I better go like that. Yes, yes, yes. God, but Moses said, show me your glory. And God said, hey, I'll put you in a cave. I'll put my hand over the cave. And then I'll pass by and you can see my back. Does God have a body? He sure does. But it's not a physical body like yours. But he has a body. So, with that said, the Bible then says, and the rest of the dead will not live again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. So those that are not believers, they're going to be raised. But how many remember the Bible says, in fact, in Revelation chapter 20, I believe it's six times in five verses, it says that he will reign for how long? A thousand years. And you're going to reign with him for a thousand years. And then there's a general resurrection. So there's a first fruits resurrection. The way the uh, Weiss translation calls it the out resurrection from among the dead. For the believers, and then there's a general resurrection. Now, if the devil had understood any of this, he would not have done what he did. The Bible says he entered Judas. And he tried to get Judas to betray Jesus, and he did. The Bible says, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. If the devil had understood redemption, that Jesus would go to the cross and shed his precious blood and redeem you and me and defeat him and take the keys of death and of Hades from him, he would have never done it. He may be smart, but he's not all-knowing. He did not understand. So Revelation 7, verse 13. Then one of the elders answered and said to me, Who are these who are arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the Lamb's blood. They, therefore, they are before the throne of God. So they're in heaven... They've come out of great tribulation. They've come out of everything that's going on on the earth. The Antichrist is here. There's war. There's all sorts of things. But they have washed their robes and made them white. How? In the Lamb's blood. Therefore, they are before the throne of God. The reason that they're in heaven is because of the blood of the Lamb. And the reason that you and I are someday going to be in heaven is not because of our works. It's because of the blood of the Lamb. We're going to be in his presence because of the blood. And by the way, in Hebrews chapter 12, it says that right in God's presence right now, 
The blood of Jesus is on a mercy seat and it is speaking in your behalf. That blood is there. That blood is talking. So 24-7, 365, in God's presence, there's blood. Jesus' blood. And that blood is speaking for you and for me. And by the way, everything the Spirit of God does, He does based on what the blood of Jesus has done. Think about that. In the Old Testament, it was like this. They took the priest and they put blood on his ear robe, of his right ear. They put blood on his right thumb and blood on his big toe. And then they took the oil. How many know what the oil represents? The Holy Spirit. And then they put the oil on top of the blood, on his ear, on his thumb, and on his toe. It's when you believe in the blood and the power of the blood that the Holy Spirit moves on your behalf and my behalf. Where the blood is honored, where the blood is believed in, the Holy Spirit moves. And we need, we need to remember that. So they are in his presence, and they're serving God because of the blood. Jesus' blood is the only way to have peace with God. It is the only way to heaven. See, Romans 3.20 says this, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. See, many people really believe that the law is what they're supposed to obey to be right with God. If they could obey the law, then they'd have peace. They'd be right with God. But listen, it says in Galatians, the law was given so sin would abound. The law was not given to make you right with God. The law was given so you'd know you're a mess. <laughs> the law was given so sin would abound. So you'd say, hey, I cannot do this on my own. I need a Savior. That's why the law was given. And if you try to be right with God by things that you do, you will never have peace. You're, 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 it's on your performance that you're trying to get there. You're saved by what Jesus did for us. We're not saved by what we do for him. You're not saved by the works of the law. And we, we've got to remember that it's by the blood. In Romans 1.16, it says, Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes, the Jew first, also the Greek. Now, the word gospel is a word actually used 74 times in the New Testament. And outside of the New Testament, in all of Greek literature, we've only found it twice. Two, two other times. Now somebody says it means good news. N yes and no. It does mean good news, but it actually means more. It says, it, this, this is the definition of gospel, almost too good to be true news. That's the definition of the gospel, almost too good to be true. All right. So God, what, what God did in Christ is so good that it's almost too good to be true. But it is true. So Lovett says it like this. The gospel, it's the power which emanates from God and saves all who believe in it. It reveals God's way of making men as righteous as himself. Now look at that bottom last part. It reveals God's way of making men, men and women, as righteous as himself. Now if you're religious, that bothers you. Because the, the, the Bible is saying the gospel makes you as righteous as God. And that's what it does. In fact, if you were to die right now and you're a believer, you would go someplace and suffer for a thousand years. No. You would go straight to heaven in God's presence and hang out with God for all of eternity with the righteousness you have right now. Is that not true? To be absent from the body is to be. You don't go someplace and suffer for a thousand years or a million years or whatever and get worthy and, and get purified and, and pay for your own sin. No. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, He that knew no sin, that's Jesus, he became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, if you're a Christian, you're in Christ. 
And in Christ, you're the righteousness of God. Because at the cross, Jesus literally had God take all of your sin and my sin and pour that into him. And he took his righteousness and poured it into us. He became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. The gospel, the news that's almost too good to be true, is God's way of making you as righteous as himself. As long as you try to do it on your own, you will never have peace with God because you just don't measure up. You say, but I'm trying really hard. I'm glad, but that's not going to make you right with God. In fact, Romans 3.20 says no one has ever been made right with God by obeying the law. You're not the first. Not Billy Graham, not Mother Teresa. No one has ever been made right with God by the things they've done. Nobody. It's through faith in his blood. Through faith in his blood. Stephen's translation. It reveals the way in which sinful men may be accepted before God and stand in his presence, approved of and forgiven. Now, there's three more things that uh, I want to do before we we close. So this is, we're not done. However, I do want you to make a confession with me right now. Could Could you repeat this? God is on my side, for the blood has been applied. Every need is supplied. No good thing shall be denied. I enter into rest, for I know that I'm blessed. In Christ I pass the test, for his blood supplies the best. The blood of Jesus purges me from every defilement of sin and the enemy. I plead the blood of Jesus over my family, over my mind, over my thoughts, over my past, over my future. Because of the blood of Jesus, I'm not guilty. I will not be condemned. Because of the blood, I have peace with God through the blood of his cross. The blood of Jesus purges my conscience to serve the living God. Through the blood, I am perfected in every good work to do his will. Now, Romans chapter 10. I want you to listen careful. It says, it was a perfect sacrifice. That's Jesus' blood. By a perfect person. That's Jesus himself. To perfect or make perfect some very imperfect people. How many of you will say you qualify for the very imperfect people? All right. But there was a perfect sacrifice, Jesus' blood, by a perfect person to perfect or make perfect some very imperfect people. And by that single offering, he did everything that needed to be done for everyone who takes part in the purifying process. So the blood did everything that needed to be done. For who? For everybody. Doesn't matter what you did. Doesn't matter what you didn't do. All right? The blood did everything that needed to be done for everyone who takes part in the purifying process. So Jesus tells this story in the Gospel of Luke. He said, two men went to the temple to pray. One's a Pharisee. The other is a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Now, notice what Jesus said. He prayed with himself. God wasn't even listening. This is what he prayed. He said, God, I thank you. I'm not like other men. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice every week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector is standing afar off. He doesn't even so much as raise his eyes to heaven. And he beats his breast. In sincerity, he's not not trying to pay for his sins. He's just saying, God, in his sincerity. He says, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
Be merciful to me, a sinner. Some of you, your Bible, this is what it says. It says, God, be propitiate to me, a sinner. Some of you, this is what your Bible says. God, be a mercy seat, a blood-covered mercy seat to me, a sinner. Best translation, be a mercy seat. This is what Jesus said. I tell you, that man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Now, the guy who said, I'm good. God, I, 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 I don't extort. I'm not unjust. I don't commit adultery. I'm a good man. And I, I tithe. I fast twice a week. So he says, God, look at all these things I don't do. And then look at all these things I do do. Do do. That doesn't probably sound right. That I'm doing. <laughs> but it is a bunch of do do as far as God's concerned. You know that, don't you? All right? So, so here's what Jesus said. There's a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person. And it did everything. So it's not the blood of Jesus plus what you've done. And it's not the blood of Jesus plus what you don't do. Right? It's just the blood of Jesus. That tax collector didn't come and say, hey, I've done this right and I haven't done this wrong. No, all that he did was say, be propitiate. Be a mercy seat to me, a sinner. <laughs> so often what we do is we get right with God by the blood, and then we try to live our Christian life by works. No, but it's all. He did everything that needed to be done for everyone who takes part in the purifying, listen, process. Pro it would say Process. In other words, there's a day you get saved, and it's working then, but it keeps working that way. It, it's not like you get saved by the blood, and then you stay saved by how good you are. Right? There's this process. So it's not the blood plus what you do. It's not the blood what you don't do. That one sacrifice, perfect sacrifice of his blood, did everything that needed to be done for everyone who takes part in that purifying process. And that is gospel. That is almost too good to be true. But it is true. It's true. It's true. It's by the blood. Plus nothing, minus nothing. Say, if this message touched your heart, and you really realize you're not where you should be with God, or you're not right with God, I'd like to pray a prayer with you. And I'd like to lead you in a prayer to surrender your life to Jesus and to receive the forgiveness that he has for you. Would you just bow your head and just pray these words out loud from your heart. Just make them your own. Just say, oh God, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins. I believe he rose again and I believe he's coming again. I give him all of my heart and all of my life. I hold nothing back and I receive the forgiveness that you have for me. I thank you I'm forgiven. I'm a part of your family on my way to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer from your heart, we believe that you are saved, that you're right with God, that you're on your way to heaven. Now, I wrote a book to help you keep growing spiritually. I want to send it to you absolutely free of charge. You can download that book or you can get contact us and we will get you a hard copy. I want to thank you so much for being with us today. We love you. We pray for you. and God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with Pastor Dwayne, congratulations. You're on the path to one of the best decisions of your life. Need more info? Our team at walkingbyfaith.tv is ready to answer your questions. To get your free copy of Pastor's book, Your New Life, click on the link in the description or download the Walking by Faith app. Packed with practical advice, this book is your guide to living a life full of faith. Claim your free copy today. Instead of just witnessing the miracle, become the miracle. Partner with Walking by Faith and ignite the spark of hope in someone's life. Let your generosity be a beacon that guides them through the darkness. To give, click on the giving link in the description below. Thank you for your unwavering support in spreading the message of hope and healing through God's word. Don't let guilt or fear win. Plead the blood of Jesus for protection from the enemy's lies. Need prayer? 
drop us a comment or click on the prayer link below. We're here for you. 